to welcome everyone to Calm Online, the webinar series. And today we have, again, a very special guest. Her name is Kate Collins. And Kate Collins is a powerhouse. She's a professional speaker. I've shared the stage with her many times, and she really connects her message with the audience and does such a phenomenal job. And today we're going to talk about how to boost your well-being and how to build resilience. And this is incredibly important, especially at this time with the pandemic and the fact that we are coming into the winter months. And Kate knows what she's talking about. She has recently written a book called The Powerhouse in You. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here, Denise. Great to see you again. So your book is The Powerhouse in You. Tell us about the subtitle. So it's how to lead with, with greater resilience, courage, and confidence. So really, as far as I'm concerned, we're all leaders. And so it's about how do I navigate my life in a way that I have, in fact, more resilience, more courage, and more confidence. Absolutely. And tell me, what is a powerhouse? Because sometimes people might be watching, and like you said, we're all leaders. So a mom's a leader, someone mm -hmm. in the community is a leader. Even in your workplace, if you're not the boss, you can still be a leader. So mm -hmm. Once you once you get that, how can you be willing to acknowledge you're also a powerhouse leader? Right. Well, it's a good thing because it's interesting. I had a couple of leaders say, but Kate, I don't want to be a powerhouse leader. I don't want to be aggressive. And I said, oh, my goodness, that's not at all what this is about. Ultimately, the book really is about helping you connect with the core of who you are. See, as a certified Pilates instructor, we talk a lot about that, about your core. Oftentimes, we refer to it as your powerhouse. So when you're in your core, that essence of who you are, you're aligned with your values, you're aligned with your purpose. Oh my gosh, everything is possible. And so it's really more about reminding you who you already are. Oftentimes we can forget that when we're busy with our checklists and you know, just checking things off of our list. We can lose sight of the fact of look at all that I've accomplished. Look at all that I've been able to endure during this pandemic. And so it's, it's really about tuning into something that's already within us. How did you get to that point? Was there a place in your life you didn't feel like much of a powerhouse leader yourself? So my question really is, where did you learn this and get that experience? Good question. So being a recovered powerhouse leader myself, <laughs> so years ago I was an executive director of an organization, and then I also worked frontline as a family children's counselor for over 15 years. And what had happened was that I just got shelled out. I was so busy trying to be all things to everybody else. I became, quite frankly, a chameleon. And so, and I really lost sight of who was Kate. And so for me, it was really when I was brought to my knees, that's when the clarity came to me that, well, actually it was a former boss that said, Kate, you know, we don't talk about this enough. You know, there's so much shame attached to when we're burnout or when we're overwhelmed. This is something that we need to bring to social work, to counseling and all of that. So on my stress leave, <laughs> I ended up creating a stress management program. And then it's kind of taken a life all its own from there. That's incredible. It's oftentimes when we go through the crisis that we create something magnificent. So in those darkest times, something wonderful can grow. So you, you mentioned about, you know, you're putting yourself last and all of those checklists and things like that. How can we gain more control over our time and set those boundaries? Because boundaries are, are crucial to finding that time, even for you who needed to set some time boundaries to write your book. Right, right. I think that it's a good question. I think that for me, Denise, the big thing is, number one, we need to believe that we're worthy of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I can say this fairly safely that a lot of women, we've been conditioned that everybody else goes first. And if we're even on the list, <laughs> maybe we'll get the leftovers. And I think that it's just really important that, you know, no different than the mask on the, on the plane when you're urged to put your mask on first. I really do believe we can't serve anybody when we're sick, uh, when we're resentful when we feel just shelled out. So for myself, I think it's just number one is we need to believe that we're worthy because we are. So one of the things that Jack Canfield, my, my mentor, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul series, as well as the success principles he talked about, is that we have three really primary limiting beliefs. And one is I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, or I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, or I'm not smart enough. And so what happens is typically we land on one of them. So let me give an example. So for me, uh, from a, a past experience, what can uh, rear up for me when I'm tired or I'm overwhelmed or taken on too much is that I'm not worthy enough. Now, it may not be necessarily that it's I'm not worthy enough for 
it could also be for success. It could be for a lot of different things. So for me, when it comes to setting boundaries, is that I need to create and carve space every single day for me. So for me, I'm a huge fan of meditation. I'm a huge fan of walking in nature. Whatever brings you joy, whatever allows you to connect with your heart. And then what happens is then in those acts of kindness for self, we build up that 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 re, that resiliency muscle, shall we say, uh, and also that really that sense of loving ourselves unconditionally. It allows us then to be able to set boundaries, and I not I mean, it's not easy. Like I think we all have somebody or people in our life that we go, I know it sounds, but I know what I need to do, but I don't know. I can't do it because I'm afraid they won't like me. And I think the key is is that you know we have to make sure that we're saying yes to the things that bring us joy and no to the things uh, that aren't. And we've all had the guilt, you know, where we've got to do this for somebody in our life or whatever. But if that's where we're hanging our hat, the majority of the time where we're saying yes, when we really feel no, what we're doing is we're doing a disservice to ourselves and we're doing a disservice to that other person. So I think boundaries really, to me, are about self-love, number one. I think that's such good advice. And when we're getting to that point of saying, let's Let's incorporate into my life things that bring me joy. How do you figure out what that is? Because for some people, they put themselves last for so long, they don't even know what brings joy anymore. Right. So one of the things, great question, that I ask people to do uh, is if I'm coaching or during my training sessions or my team retreats is that I ask them to write a joy list. So write down, and sometimes I get them to kind of create a little bit of urgency. So, okay, put the timer on, you know, on your on your phone or wherever and just go, okay, go. I, I got 10 minutes. I got to write all this out. So all the things that bring you joy. So it, sometimes it's hard to get your head around. Well, I don't know. So part of it is, well, what makes that little kid in you all excited? Like I love being chased, for example. It sounds funny uh, by my grandchildren or by, you know, when our dog was alive, I love being chased, but then eventually I couldn't take it anymore and I would stop and let them get to me. So that brings me joy. Belly laughing brings me joy. Nature's huge for me. Fitness, like you, is very, very big for me. So sometimes it's a matter of having that ongoing live list that you can just keep adding to it. And sometimes even asking your friends and the people closest to you, what brings you joy? And then there may be something on that buffet table of things uh, that they share that you decide, wait a minute, I've got to add that. I love to travel. I want to put that on my joy list. So I think that's it. Having that joy list nearby will certainly support us when we have those days when we're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I agree. And I want to help those who are watching with a phrase that you helped me with, Kate. And you'll recognize this phrase right away. So when you're saying, I can't do something, or when you're having doubts, or when something's not worked out, and you're affirming the negative, you say, until now. Right. I put myself last, until now. Well, I've never had time to take care of myself, until now. So mm -hmm. it's really important to watch what we say to ourselves. And how important do you think that self-talk is when it comes to resilience and bouncing back, particularly in, in times like the pandemic? Well, I think it's huge. I mean, really, uh, that, that was uh, one of the trainers from Jack Canfield. She used to say up until now. And, you know, she's just brilliant. And so if you want to know more about her, you can always reach out to me because right now I am blanking out on her name. Isn't that awful? Um, but I think what it does is it interrupts the old pattern because sometimes we don't even realize how much we say things about ourselves internally or externally that really become blockers for us. And so I think it's really important to, you know, that language really helps us to, to shift our energy, shift our thoughts to going, well, wait a minute, I used to think that way. That was the past. And that might even been five minutes ago, the past. So I think it's really important that we, we become much more aware and conscious of our thought process, as well as the things we say. Like, for example, when a woman gets a compliment all the time, she oftentimes she'll say, or someone will say, oh, this whole thing, oh, I got this on sale, or I got it here, or I've had it forever, rather than just thank you, thank you, and just take the gift in. So I think we're a society where it, it's important that we really allow ourselves to receive the gifts. And, you know, part of that is by simply shifting our thinking. I love Dr. Wayne Dyer, his comment of when I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. And so that's a big one for me is that if I'm feeling overwhelmed, if I'm feeling sluggish, if I'm feeling just a way down, it's because 
uh, my thinking has gone somewhere that's not serving me well. Oftentimes it's maybe gone, the train's cut off the track. Yes, and it's so important for everyone to remember that sometimes you think something negative about yourself or about life and it feels true. But just because something feels true doesn't make it true. A feeling is just a feeling. And also, it's okay to have the feelings you feel. You're allowed to feel sad when something sad happens. You're allowed to feel frustrated or disappointed and excited and happy. You're allowed to feel all the feels. Why do you think it is that we sometimes think we should only be happy? And what are your thoughts on that? Because I believe that's the happiness myth. We're not meant to be happy all of the time. We're not. And it's it's so, so interesting you say that. So I was in a group this morning, a mastermind group this morning, and I know the one uh, leader said, you know, I just like, let's just move on, just move on with this COVID thing. And just, I could see, I could feel the force. And she literally clapped her hands like that and said, let's just get it over with Let's just move on. And when I had time for my uh, turn to share, I said, you know what? I just think that it's important for me to just trust that people are exactly where they need to be. I think that we're all going through a grieving uh, experience right now through COVID. And it's all going to affect us in different ways. And I think that, and I'm probably not capturing this really well, but I read somewhere uh, recently where the person said, why do I need to know what a person is going through before then I give them compassion? Why don't I just give them compassion now? So I think that feeling our feelings, again, feelings aren't facts. Uh, however, I think that feelings are really important. And I, and I say this very humbly because, um, you know, I have to say that I can be one of those people that gets in my head. I've got that type A personality. And, you know, I, I loved kind of moving and shaking and all of that stuff. So even when I was writing my book, truthfully, Denise, there were times where I got, oh, you got to get better at this. <laughs> because, you know, I think that a lot of people, for example, I've, I'm author of some various uh, lost CDs. One is relationship estrangement and ending. And the other is around grief of the death of a loved one. And what I find is a culture, we really suck at this, to be truthful. Um, I don't think that's a political term or a, probably a professional term, but, but what I mean by that is that somewhere in our minds, we have this X on the calendar, right? Like, I'm going to be done with it. And it's just like, that's not how grief works. Grief comes in waves. You know, I have worked with people where five years after the death of something, whether a divorce or whether it's an estranged relationship or whether it's the death of a loved one, and I would say to them, well, because you've immersed yourself in your work. I mean, workaholism is a is a really easy way to hide for a lot of people. And then no wonder all of a sudden they fall apart like Humpty Dumpty five years later, two years later, is because they've never really fully given themselves permission to feel what they need to feel. And I think that, you know, it's one thing that I'm still coaching myself on to be transparent of um, I'm getting so much better now when it's you know, when I am feeling sadness and, you know, sometimes obviously you're about to be interviewed or you're about to go on stage or in this case, virtually, you know, I may say, okay, I'm going to now write this in my calendar. I'm going to give myself permission later today to do some journaling, to do some crying, to reach out and get some support. Cause I think it is very important because that's where things can go deeper, whether it turns into depression or serious anxiety, or I think uh, we, we've got a lot of feelings that are still kind of sitting there and we need to give ourselves permission just to say, yeah, I'm not going to be consumed by the sadness. I'm not going to be consumed by the anger. Uh, that's a big one for women in particular is anger. You know, I, I get a little, um, as you know, I'm a strong advocate for women. And and I get really uh, kind of annoyed sometimes when I hear men or women will say things like, you know, we'll kind of get over it kind of thing. And it's like, wait a minute. You know what? It's It's okay for the males in my life to get angry. However, why isn't it okay for me? Obviously, I'm not going to hurt anyone. That's never my intention, verbally or physically. However, it's or, or emotionally, but I think it's really important that with a full range of emotions, we give ourselves permission to kind of get it out. Because you're right, there's times where, and sometimes we don't even know why we're feeling a certain way. And that's where creating the space in our, in our day to just really tap into what might it be. I think that's what really helps. And you know what else helps is having the right people around that you can confide in. I think you know that I went through a bout of situational depression in 2017, where I was in a really dark place in terms of being severely depressed. And uh, my sister knew how bad it was. And I, I can understand now, I came, I would never have um, committed suicide, but if I, if I didn't have my two daughters, I can see how people consider that as an option. 
And so I went and got some therapy for this. And I was talking to my sister, who's one of my top five powerhouse people. And she said, Denise, you can't commit suicide. She said, it doesn't end the pain. It just passes the pain along to the ones you love. And I thought, wow, I cannot pass on the pain. And so there's so many ways we can look at that. Don't pass on the pain to other people and don't pass on the pain. Right. Like Beautiful. experience it, have the grief, see a therapist. I did. And it's helpful. We need someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it's the right people. So let's talk about those right people in your book. You write about surrounding yourself with powerhouse people. So how do we choose our people? And is it is it actually a rule of thumb where it's good to have the top five? Well, in this case, it's not a so good question. So when I'm referring to powerhouse people, again, first of all, I have to it starts with me and ends with me. So I need to know, first of all, and at some level, have the door open, for example, uh, that I am a powerhouse. So, so for example, when I start to then start to work on me or continue the journey of working on myself, then what happens is I'll know that what brings me joy, I'll know that, you know, what my strengths are and own those. And I think that for me, that's what will help us decide who those powerhouse people are. So, for example, in my journey where I am today is that it's really important that the people that are uh, in you know, that top five for me, they're authentic, that they're people that are really quite uh, willing to be vulnerable and talk about the insecurities and talk about the truth of what's going on in their heads and in their hearts. Uh, my younger brother, Mike, for example, is one of those people. And so we call each other on our stuff, whether we like it or not. Um, we celebrate with each other our, our wins and our successes. So I think that for me, having those people around, I think we, it's quite individual what that means for you. I mean, for me, I know confidentiality is really cool, uh, like a big part of that. I need to feel that with those people that I can trust them, that they're safe uh, on all levels for me. So. I think again that if you're someone out there that says, hey, but I don't have anybody, that's okay. You know, the key is, is that now you have an opportunity to be able to say, okay, so who would I like to invite to my playground? Who would I like to play with? Who would I like to be able to share, have that healthy exchange? Uh, Part of my powerhouse as well is that, I don't know about you, Denise, if you have experienced this or the viewers have experienced this, but, you know, sometimes there's people that come along and we mentor them and sometimes you know, we have mentors for us. And so the powerhouse for me, or usually it's about some level of exchange. I'm not saying that there isn't times where it'll be a little bit different. However, it's really important to me that in that powerhouse for myself anyway, that there is some element of exchange. If I feel like I'm always giving to you, um, then it, it, the teeter totter is going to be a little bit imbalanced. Uh, again, I want to be clear. Sometimes it has to be imbalanced because of what someone's navigating. However, if the, you know, again, uh, I always joke and say to my husband, do they inspire you or do they expire you? That's always a fun one with the uh, funeral industry because I do a lot of work with the funeral associations in North America and throughout North America. So, but it's true. You know, we all have those people where you go, why, why did I call them? Like, what was that about? Why did I think for one moment that they could somehow help me with this? If anything, I feel worse. (laughs) I know. I hear you. So it's very clear to know when you're reaching out to someone, what is it that you want? And who is that person for you? Because if you reach out to the wrong person, (laughs) I call them your go-to people. In my book, Calm, I have a go-to people checklist. And I say, you want to avoid asking a negative thinker for their input on your situation. Because they'll be able to tell you all sorts of things that could go wrong. And speaking about (laughs) books, Kate, I want to talk about your book. We have around 11 minutes left. And you have four rooms that you talk about in your book. So tell us about these fit rooms that you have. Okay, so this was actually something that uh, years ago, when I moved to the Durham area, in fact, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to reinvent myself. So I was doing training and the professional speaking prior to coming to the Durham area and many, many years ago. And I thought, oh my gosh, and I was feeling very vulnerable, feeling insecure, wondering where to start. And I'd gone to a meditation uh, group and I ended up becoming friends with this wonderful indigenous friend of mine. And he said, Kate, in our tribe, we believe that in order for us to have balance, in order for us, in order to be able to uh, be be connected to our purpose and step into our power, we need to enter each of these four rooms every day. And so what I did was I tweaked it 
use some of my language from my fitness, as well as what really I think people want to experience rather than saying your mentally room, your mental room. I thought that that could go either way for people. <laughs> so we changed it to mentally fit room, emotionally fit room, your physically fit room and your spiritually fit room. And then I'm able to create some strategy. So the book really is giving people some hands on. It's really probably half of a workbook, I would say as well. And it just took a life all its own because I wanted people to be able to sit with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and go, hmm, okay, let me think about that. Some self-reflection, some work that maybe I could look, you know, in that room. So the idea is, is to enter each of those rooms every day. Now that's not always possible, right? So, but sometimes I just playfully say, so which ones have the lights out? Which ones haven't you been in in a little while? Which ones have they got cobwebs? Uh, and so the intention is, I think we all know usually, you know, you know, which room is out of, you know, it, are we not checking in as much too? So if let's say you're having right now, we have a sleep crisis. So I talk about that, for example, in the physically fit room and, and, and ways in which very strategically people can support quieting their minds. So that's one thing that I do. So, so the four rooms are just really, and I've been using this in my work for these are earned <laughs> 20 plus years. And so it was really, when I was getting CEO say to me, Kate, I, I bring your handouts, your four rooms with me when I jump on the plane, when I go into a meeting. So I kept thinking, okay, I've got to pay attention to this. If it's really resonating, maybe this is something that I need to include in the book as well. So that's really how that got birthed. Let's go back for a moment. You said something that really intrigued me. We're in the middle of a sleep crisis right now. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got a lot of people like, I work with a lot of different people who are real powerhouses, very successful. And they're finding that they're having a tough time turning their their brains off. And so one of the things that, you know, I talk about is think about when you were very small. And I know everybody has different experiences of their childhood. Uh, so if, if it's not you, maybe it's somebody else that you've observed with their children. But bedtime, at least in my family, uh, both for myself as a parent and as a child, was that, you know, it was very clear about this is the bedtime and here's a routine of what we're going to do. So, so that you're literally telling your brain leading up to it, what's going to happen. So bedtime for me is actually a real fun time. I've created that in my mind. Um, and I, I am a fan of no technology in the bedroom. I don't even have a, any kind of light in the sense of there's no clock radio in there. Uh, we've got blackout curtains so that it's very dark. And I make it so that it's a place that's very inviting and welcoming. And so, you know, I know that some, uh, for example, some doctors, physicians, that that's their specialty around sleep therapy, they, they say no reading, but I have, I guess, maybe trained my brain to see this as a nice, enjoyable reward from my day. And so then I'm, I might only read two pages <laughs> and then I drift off. Uh, so, but for me, it's like getting ourselves into that space of having that consistent bedtime routine of finding ways to wind down, whether you have a hot soap or a hot shower before you go to sleep, whether, uh, again, I'm really big on not uh, any kind of negative news or any violent shows or media prior to bed, because again, you've overstimulated your brain. And so, you know, it's the same idea of being able to allow you, I listen to the same meditation CD every single night. Um, and lots of times I fall asleep with her. And so I think it's one of those things of finding the things that work for you and then uh, just doing it regularly. And I think it's hard for some people because their idea of fun is, or not even just fun, in all fairness, during the stress, a lot of people's coping mechanisms to help them feel better actually backfires with the sleeping. And I know, I do know that the American Psychological Association said that one in five adults reports feeling more stressed when they don't get enough sleep. And half of all people who are already stressed feel even more stressed when they don't get enough sleep. And I know that some of the things we do to wind down, your strategies are great, but some for some people, what they'll do is they'll watch their, their, their iPad, a movie on the iPad. And I know when I say some people, I mean me. <laughs> and I thought, come on, the blue light's really not affecting me that much. And then what happened was I was playing this word puzzle game on my computer and it was a weekend co tournament competition thing. And I was so close to winning this imaginary crown that I kept playing it for hours before bed and I didn't sleep all night. And that's the only thing different I could think of was the blue light. And then another thing that I, I know that people will do to unwind is maybe have a glass of wine or a bev alcoholic beverage. And then what that does is they might fall asleep quickly, but then the second half of the sleep is interrupted. So they toss and turn. 
And it's just such a, a delicate balance to think, okay, I want to reduce stress in my life. Let me take a look at Kate's book and see some of the ideas she's recommending to help me sleep better, <laughs> as opposed to some of the things that are working against me. Well, and I like what you were saying there too, Denise, being able to take a look at sort of what, what was different in the routine that you then had that awareness which is a really big deal. So I talk about the three A's, you know, so the awareness of, okay, so what was I doing differently that got that result? And then, you know, the other part is accepting. Okay, so I did do, I did it. I, I, I watched my, you know, use the iPad in bed and now it's like action. So what am I going to do differently to get a different result? Because I think we're all prone to like, you know, for me, I just, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you're a doctor or you've got to do lung surgery, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, I think for sure have your phone there is really important to have it on. But I know lots of people use their phone to wake up and all that stuff. See, I just can't do it because that dinging, you know, we know that, you know, Facebook and all of these smartphone, uh, you know, they've, they've been pretty creative on how they get us hooked on this stuff and we get the adrenaline rush. So I think it's really important. And like you're saying, we know things like, you know, exercise before sleep isn't so great. Uh, drinking for sure. Alcohol isn't so great. You know, uh, making sure that like, I love the idea of kind of if you've got something heavy in your heart going on, this is one thing I used to do with my son. So this might be good for your book, actually, now that I think about it, your upcoming book. And that is we did a, a little we, we did a little basket outside of his, his door. This is when he was just a little guy. He's 26 now. Uh, but he'd have this is the time when he was doing nightmares and having the odd night terror. So he would draw a picture of what it was that was scaring him. And I wouldn't look at it or he could put some words on it, depending on his age. And he would put it outside. We put it in the basket on the door, like inside of it. It was like a little pouch. And I think that there's something to be said for us as even adults to be able to say, OK, where can I write this? Some people call this a God box. Some people call it a creator box or a, hey, a turning it over to the universe. But getting it outside of our bedroom, so therefore we're not thinking about it throughout that sleep cycle, I think is really important. Ooh, getting it outside of the room. That goes so well with your different rooms that you talk about, your different fit rooms. And it reminds me, I was speaking at the Heart of Networking conference and I mentioned the owner, co-owner, he, he owns the UPS store in Ajax with his wife. And he, his name is Dennis Hebert, and he is one of the happiest men you will ever meet. And I'm always curious about what makes people happy. So I said, you're very positive. How do you do this? And he said, well, when I come into work each day, I wipe my feet on the mat. And I, I, he paused and I waited. And he said, and then I leave everything outside, outside. And he mm -hmm. said, then when I go at the end of the day, before I leave work, I wipe my feet on the mat. And I leave all of the work at work. And so yeah. what, a good, what a good way of thinking about that. And I mentioned it to him. I said, I remember that. He said, I told you that years ago. I said, it was such a great visual. So what you're talking about with the basket and leaving things outside the room is brilliant. Because, listen, we don't just use, we don't just use our phones as leaders for alarms. We use it as a, as a crutch, as a, <laughs> as a, as a, uh, what do you call it? A flashlight to go to the washroom. We use it to see who texted in the middle of the night. That's so unhealthy because if you get a bad text, you're like, ah, I can't sleep. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I think the key is for all of us is we all know where we need to, I think, make an adjustment. So I'm a huge fan of, and that's the coach in me, is that, you know, let's not go for, you know, like the end result, the big one, like maybe just say something small. Okay. So I'm not going to have my phone. I'm not going to have my phone in my, my bedroom tonight. <laughs> and then we'll try tomorrow night. And then maybe we'll try it for seven days. And then maybe we'll try it for 14 days and then we'll try it for 21 days. And I think that again, the results always to me are always, I don't know. They always make me go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this more consistently now. So Kate, if people want to get a copy of your book, or if they want to contact you for coaching or one of your fabulous retreats, what's the best way to get in touch with you and to get their hands on this book? Well, it's powerfuljourney.com. So www.powerfuljourney.com. And that's actually where my book is. It's it's on my site. You can get an ebook. And then we right now we're doing a very special where people are getting a, a personalized, I'm signing it to whoever it is that you're perhaps gifting or for yourself. And there, there's also an opportunity for a discovery call if people want to connect with me. So I'd love to, to connect with anybody who sort of feels like, hey, I'd like to take this to the next level.
Oh, great. So it's a fantastic book with lots of fabulous ideas and the possibility of connecting with you for further coaching. Kate, it's such a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Denise. This is a lot of fun. And thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you next time on Calm Online. Bye, Kate. Bye-bye. Take care, Denise.